All right, welcome back everyone to the third installment of the Ceph Tech Talks. Uh, if you would like to see the first two, if you missed one of them, there's the talk on Rados by uh, tech lead Sam Just and the RBD talk by uh, Josh Durgan. Uh, those are both up on the Ceph YouTube channel. Uh, don't miss those. <clears throat> if you would like to have more information on how to join these, if you're viewing it on YouTube, uh, we're on the ceph.com slash ceph tech talks, separated by hyphens, uh, on the ceph site, which would give you all the information that you need to join for the next one, uh, which I believe will be on the 23rd of April. Uh, we'll be talking about calamari then. Uh, these are typically on the fourth Thursday of the month at 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern uh, Standard or Daylight Time. Uh, and we're on the Blue Jeans uh, video conferencing tool that we use for Ceph Developer Summits and other things. So uh, today's talk topic is going to be on the Rados Gateway. Uh, the tech lead Yehuda is here to give us a rundown of the inner workings of RGW. Yehuda, you want to take it away? Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. Oh, great. All right. So I'm uh, Yehuda, and I'll be talking about the Rados Gateway and how it works. So, so uh, first I want to have a brief recap of the Ceph architecture. So, um, Ceph is a software-defined storage. It is a scalable distributed storage system with no single point of failure. At its core, um, Ceph has an object storage called Rados. Rados is responsible for man managing data placement and replication. It provides the building blocks for the different storage solutions that Ceph provides, which are um, the main ones are the Ceph file system, the Rados block device or RBD, and the Rados gateway, RGW. A library called LibRados provides the glue that enables creating all these different services. It has a rich set of APIs that can be used to access the data in Rados. All of these services are built on a common service uh, managing data placement and replication called Rados. The Rados interface um, tries to make it simple um, to reason about accessing distributed storage. Objects are divided into flat namespace pools. Each pool can have different, name, different placement rules, allowing the user, for example, to place some objects exclusively on fast SSD OSDs or on slow spinning disk OSDs within the same cluster. Applications written against Redis can rely on the relative simplicity of the CP consistency that it provides. Um, users can write applications for Rados using the lib Rados interface available in multiple programming languages, and these are quite rich. It supports partial, partial overwrites of objects rather than requiring objects to be overwritten in their entirety, which made it very easy to create RBD. Each object can also have a set of user-defined standard attributes, which is very useful for storing a small amount of frequently accessed metadata, a feature that is being used in RGW. Each object is associated with an ordered key value mapping called object map or OMAP. This object map is currently implemented by, by keeping a level DB instance within each OSD. This key value mapping is useful, for example, for representing the RGW bucket index. We also support atomic writes or read transactions on a single object. An atomic read transaction can be used to atomically fetch an attribute and an extent of the data payload. An atomic write transaction might be used to atomically check an attribute and conditionally add a set of key value mapping redos <coughs> of, of key value mapping. Redos object classes can also be loaded into the OSD to add additional Redos operations. For example, uh, example for that might be the advisory locking that uh, we use in uh, RGW and in, in RPD. So, but uh, if you if you want to learn more about Redos, you can. Um, go to the presentation by Sam Just for, from a couple of months ago. Um, 
now let's move to the gateway itself. Um, the Rails gateway provides an S3 and Swift compatible interfaces to applications that use object storage. A Rados gateway deployment includes a Rados cluster with a set of Rados gateway processes, which serve S S3 or Swift requests from a, um, from application uh, <coughs> using a Liberados connection to the Rados cluster. So the RGW is, is a Liberados application that uses Liberados. As with other SF entities, RGW is designed to be able to scale horizontally and multiple RGW services can be set to run in parallel and provide access to the same data. RGW provides two, front, two main front ends. Uh, it can run at a fast CGI server needing Apache or other web server that supports fast CGI to serve the HTTP requests. It can also run as a standalone HTTP server using the Civet Web embedded server to serve the HTTP requests. Um, Civet Web, uh, for anyone that doesn't know, is uh, relatively new. We introduced it in Firefly. It's a spin off or fork of uh, the Mongoose embedded HTTP server. And um, other than these two front ends, we also have a third front end currently that we use for um, load generation. It basically cuts up of the 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 actual users from from generating queries it allows the, the gateway itself to generate queries um it's called login but it's not it's not very not highly used by anyone um but it it was very useful for uh, perf performance improvements that we were doing so Internally, and that's really a rough uh, block diagram, um, RGW is broken into multiple logical modules. The front end that I just mentioned, uh, the REST dialect that handles either S3 or Swift, or we have um, another dialect would be the Swift auth. Um, and potentially we can add other APIs, for example, the Google storage API. The execution layer that is common to any dialect. So we have um, a specific dialect, uh, S3, for example, and then it goes into an execution core that is common to the S3 one or the Swift one. So uh, this allows us maintaining a single unified view of the data. RGW Redis is internally the layer that is responsible for managing all the RGW data by using Redis. So it is where the RGW semantics meet the Redis semantics. For example, where we do the object striping, where we handle the atomic overrides, managing the bucket index and so forth. Um, other than these, we have um, the the code that's responsible for user management and authentication. Uh, there are kind of a in, internal threads that handle garbage collection, handle quote, quota, and all of that runs on the Redis gateway process. It uses Lib Redis to communicate with the Redis backend, and some of the code that RGW uses uh, runs as um, object, cl object classes within the OSDs. So part of the RGW code actually runs on the OSDs themselves. Um, an object storage system like S3 has users. Each user can create multiple buckets, and in each bucket, objects can be stored in a flat, flat namespace. The system supports an authentication system and provides access control mechanisms. Our job provides both the S3 and Swift RESTful APIs while presenting the same data through either of these. 
while Redis itself is also an object storage, it provides different semantics and characteristics than the one that is than the ones that are needed for the RESTful object storage system. Um, for example, uh, a few examples where they differ. In Redis, the general guidelines are that object sizes should be limited, usually to a few megabytes per object. With RESTful object storage, the limit is usually in the few terabytes range, and that also probably flexible. Uh, there's no real reason uh, why that should shouldn't be should actually be limited to to you know to the amount of sizes that the system itself can can handle. Redis objects are mutable, whereas uh, S3 objects are immutable, cannot be partially over cannot be partially written, only completely overwritten. Redis keeps no index of objects, and listing objects is an operation in the order of the number of placement groups in the pool holding them. It also does not provide sorted list of those. So a user that needs to read the, the list of objects um, that reside in a Redis pool needs to basically fetch all the objects in the pool in order to provide it a list, uh, a sorted list uh, of these objects as the S3 API and the Swift API um, require. Redos provides um, course per pool permission. So in Redos, you can specify which users can read and write, or you can, can specify permissions for, for a pool. Say this user can read data from that pool, this user can write, uh, but it's per the entire pool. In S3, uh, the, the permissions are per object. So you, you specify it on, um, specify, uh, and for an object, you can specify a list of users that can access it. Yeah. Which is, by the way, unlike uh, Swift. In Swift, it's uh, a bit different. And the Redis Gateway provides a, a, a superset of, of this functionality. It can provide provides both the Swift per container or per per bucket permissions and the S3 per object permissions. RGW objects are composed of two main logical parts the object head and the object tail. The object head contains all the object's metadata. This includes the manifest that describes the object layout, the object's attributes, ACLs, and the user-defined object attributes. So users can, can specify specific special attributes on the objects. And all, all of that is contained in the, the head itself. The head can also include the initial part of the data, usually not more than 512 case. Um, the tail holds the object's remaining data and it is striped. Usually uh, we use the, the four megabyte size for, for the striping. A very small object will usually not have a tail. So if you have an object up to the size of 512 case, um, then the object is not, is only contain the RGW objects or watch what, what users would look at as the S3 objects or the Swift object will be composed only a single Redis object, uh, which only is only the head. Although, although it is possible for a small object to also have a tail, but that's beside the point. Uh, when accessing an object, the object's head is read in its entirety using a single Redis I.O. operation. So smaller objects require only a single round trip to the backend in order to be read. Now, this, this Redis I.O. operation is a compound operation. So in, in this one I.O., we basically say, send a request to say, that's saying, um, get me all the object's attributes and read 512 Ks. Um, but but that only that is one atomic operation that takes one 
round trip to the Rails backend. Objects are accessed directly without needing to consult any me metadata server. The object's head is named by uh, concatenating the bucket index ID and adding to their RGW object name. Um, once we read the object's head, we can access the rest of the object's data. As the head holds the manifest um, that describes the object. The manifest is embedded in one of the object's attributes. So in order to, to access an object, we only need to have the bucket instance ID and the object's name. For each bucket, RGW maintains an index that resides in a radius object within an OMAP, uh, what I talked earlier, um, the object map, which is a key value storage that can be created for each radius object. And it can provide a sorted list of all the objects that belong to that bucket. Starting at Hammer, uh, our upcoming uh, major release, the bucket index can be sharded and stored on multiple radius objects. So we, we no lo we longer longer um, require having a single um, object that, that um, might might be a contention point when writing multiple objects to the, sa to the same uh, bucket. When dealing with object versioning, the bucket index is responsible for maintaining the version order for each object. Um, that, that, that that point is mainly maybe users that use S3 um, are familiar with the versioning API that S3 provides, and we provide it too, starting at Hammer. And in that, um, when you create um, multiple ver versions of the same object, the object versions are ordered by the order of creation. And you always have uh, the the current version of the object, but if you remove the current ob version of the object, you you're gonna uh, move back. The current version is gonna move back to the previous version, and and so forth. So the bucket index itself is responsible for managing the, this ordering. It also holds. The, uh, the backend index also holds the changes logs for multi-zone data synchronization. So when we are doing multi-zone synchronization, the backend index keeps uh, a log of all the operations hap happening or happen in that specific bucket. So later on, we can um, look at the bucket index and replay these operations on the target zone. Now, Redis provides atomicity to operations that are being done on a single Redis object. It is, as I said earlier, allows us to bundle multiple operations on a single Redis object into one Redis request, so it, we do uh, we call liberators operate, and and we can do like t maybe twenty operations on the same object, and I, I I don't know how many operations are whether it's actually bounded, but we can do many many operations, and all of them are gonna be applied atomically. RGW uses that, for example, when it creates the object. It creates the object's head in a single compound operation that both writes the object's data and writes the object's metadata. It also guards against data races, makes sure that the object hasn't been overwritten without us noticing it. However, when creating an RGW object, multiple objects can be created and everything needs to be coordinated with a bucket index. And Redis does not provide atomicity for multiple object operations. We need the bucket index to reflect the existence 
of the created object, but the Redis layer does not provide the needed atomicity. So when an object is created, we first write the object stale. Then using a two-phase commit on the backend index, we send a prepare request to the backend index, create the object set, and then we send a commit request to the backend index. This ensures that any failure in one of those steps will be discovered and the bucket index will be consistent with the object in the bucket. A bucket index prepare and complete request, that's not something that a regular object storage usually provides. Uh, and when I'm talking about object storage, I'm talking about the backend that uh, we're using not RGW as an object storage. Um, Redis is extensible and allows us to add such functionality by using the object classes. Object classes, um, just to reiterate, is a piece of software that we can create the trance on, on the OSD side and is executing at the Redis IO path. It can read an object, can mutate it, uh, thus making our lives easier by limit eliminating a need for doing a lot of racy read, modify, write sequences. RW makes a heavy use of the object classes and it is used for multiple features like the bucket index, uh, maintenance, usage logging, garbage collection, advisory locking, and so on. The quota feature is an example of an, another example of a feature that takes advantage of the object classes. We have a code that runs on the OSD and aggregates total data consumed in a bucket and total data consumed by user. When we create an object, instead of needing to keep track of on the RGW side of how much data the user has, which is problematic due to the distributed nature of the system, we can have multiple gateways uh, each consume uh, their own data, creating their own objects. The other RGW not necessarily doesn't necessarily know about that data. So we lazily send an object class call with the new object size, which in turn updates the internal accounting directly on the OSD. Later, RGW will read that info and will know whether a user has exceeded its quota. Now, I um, mentioned that in order to access an object, we need to know the bucket instance ID for that object. However, this, informa this info information is not necessarily readily available for the gateway. For each bucket, we hold two different objects, the bucket entry point that points at the current bucket instance and the bucket instance object. This is needed uh, because a bucket may be removed and created, so we need to know which instance we refer to. Um, in order for this to be efficient, RGW keeps a cache of all metadata information. This also includes the user metadata, so that we don't need to reread user information for every request. RGW uses Redis feature called Watch Notify for cache validation of the metadata cache. Each RGW is setting a watch on several watch objects. When a gateway changes a metadata object, it sends a notification on these objects so that all the gateway that watch these objects can update their internal metadata cache. This applies to all metadata and it includes packet metadata changes like packet creation, modification, removal, and user information changes like user creation, uh, user suspensions, and so forth. A Redis gateway admin process uh, that can be used to, to do those metadata changes. For example, creating a user uses uh, watch notify too. So a metadata change that goes through Redis Gateway Admin will affect the running cluster. A single RGW process can manage a single zone and a single 
RGW zone defines a, a set of Redis pools in a Ceph cluster, as RGW keeps all its data in Redis pools. It keeps a pool for the object data, a pool for bucket index data, and a few pools for bucket and user metadata. It also keeps pools for logging of changes needed for multi-zone replication. That's beyond uh, the logging that we keep in the bucket index. For example, we keep um, uh, all the information about all the objects that changed in a bucket in within the bucket index, but we also keep uh, a list of all the buckets that have changes in them so that we don't need to go over all the buckets in the system to in order to discover what uh, changes happened. We also um, keep the state of a, a, the current sync process so that next time uh, that we go uh, and continue with the sync process, we, we know where to start from and, and so on. It is possible to configure multiple RGW zones on a single Ceph cluster. However, each needs to use a distinct set of pools. It is possible to define multiple placement targets or storage policies. This makes it possible to define that data will reside on different Redis pools with different storage properties. For example, we can define a gold po policy where all the data resides on SSDs, a silver policy where the data reside, resides on spinning disks, and a bronze policy where the data is on a spinning disk and also uses erasure coding, for example. Uh, we can then define the default storage policy that each user can use. Users can set the storage policy they use for each bucket uh, that they create, and administrators can limit the policies that each user can choose. A region is a set of zones that represent a logical geographical area. Now, a side note, the term um, region has been kind of confusing, and we, we decided that zone group is probably better suited, and in the future we may switch to using it. There is a master region that serves all the master, it serves as the master for all metadata. All the zones in a single region deal with the same data. With the current architecture, a region will have one master zone and zero more zones that replicate its data and are used for disaster recovery. Different regions maintain different data, but users do have a single global namespace where you, uh, like all, all their buckets, when, when a user lists uh, its buckets, it gets a list for all the buckets that it owns, regardless of their location. Accessing data will require the user to access the correct RGW, otherwise it will get an HTTP redirect response that will send it to the correct location. So it's better for user to access the the actual zone where the data is, otherwise it's gonna go to, to a zone in the wrong region and be redirected to the correct region, and thus um, making it much longer much slower to access the data. <clears throat> the sync agent is responsible for coordination, coordinating the data synchronization between the different zones. It handles both metadata synchronization and data synchronization. Updated metadata is fetched from the master zone in the master region and applied at the target zone. So the master zone at the master region is the authority for all the metadata in the system. New data is copied from the master zone to the target zone. Now, th this will might change in the future, uh, but that uh, with the current architecture, architecture. In the future, it, we plan to have um, 
it's possible to have data written in all zones of the same region and and have it synced be between them not just from the master zone to the secondary note that the agent itself does not read the data it sends appropriate commands to the rgw as the target zone and it's and the target zone itself fetches the data directly from the appropriate source so the sync agent works through the different change logs and see that the data has changed so it tells the secondary zone uh, go fetch this object from that bucket on on your master zone um, and but the sync agent itself does does not read any data so it's not in the data path um what's next for us uh as i just mentioned active active architecture for um multi zone uh configuration multi tenancy is also uh on our radar it's the the ability to be able to have um, different tenants for RGW. Um, currently, the RGW user model um, mir mirrors the S3 user model, or heavily influenced by it at least. And where you have one global namespace, um, a user can create a bucket in that namespace, but another user cannot create a bucket in that namespace. Uh, in, with multi-tenancy, it would be possible for each user to have its own, or each tenant to have its own um, namespace where its users are going to reference this specific namespace and not just a global one. Um, another feature that, that we see um, is the object expiration in which uh, it's, it's a feature similar to the one that S3 has and Swift also has something similar in which um, it would be possible to, to specify expiration for uh, objects or expiration rules on buckets and for example all, all the objects starts with a specific prefix we want them to be expired after one week or expiration might mean that if, if the, the bucket is version that then it means that the objects will still exist but will not be current and then we can say after a month another month completely remove these objects or another possibility is to say after a month move those um, objects to a different storage policy so that's um that's object expiration and nfs um the ability to export rgw objects through nfs um that's about it uh thank you any questions At this point, if anybody has questions, they can feel free to type them in the chat or ask them out loud. Uh, looks like we got one from Eric. Uh, is the Civet web server ready for production in Hammer? Does it scale well? Um, we we believe that it is um, on its way uh, and it's ready for production. Um, we have been we have set it as um, a default front end. Uh, I think it's starting. I'm not sure if we, we put it in Giant as a, the default or in Hammer. Hammer. Um, and we've been pretty happy with uh, with its performance and 
with with uh, stability. And we've yet to have um, users complaining about Civet Web, but it, it, the the most important thing about Civet Web is that it makes installation much much easier for users. It removes all the extra complexities involving um, Apache and uh, fast CGI uh, installation and with fast CGI we we uh, had so so much grief um, the pr problem with the uh, fast CGI not supporting 100 continue or a few there there are nowadays three different fast CGI prov uh, modules for for Apache each has its own issues um, we we don't have all that with uh, Civet Web. Uh, yeah, there's a bunch of other questions coming in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see some of those. One from uh, What if we run different versions of Rados Gateway and Ceph, for example, Ceph version Firefly against giant RGWs? How how much are things expected to be decoupled from Librados? Well, it's completely decoupled from Librados, but it de it depends on on uh, the the object classes. I don't, I don't think we do uh, QA of mixed versions, so I cannot guarantee um, how it's going to work. You will need to have um, the OSDs run the latest versions. It's a, a Firefly Redis gateway in theory, and 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 I'm not putting a QA stamp on it because it's not tested. If a, a Firefly uh, Redis gateway in theory should work with a giant uh, uh, OSD, uh, object classes and OSD because we do maintain backwards compatibility. We try to, but as far as how much testing goes into it, I I, I wouldn't do it because it's not not been tested always better to have the same versions across yeah. <laughs> all your pieces uh let's see another one here from uh, bh was since each rgw instance sets watch points on buckets and other metadata how many rgw instances can we bring up well it sets watch points not on the bucket and metadata it sets on specific objects um which are used for control uh, information. I, I don't think that has been te tested. I don't think we've made um, we've tested how many Aljabi instances we can can uh, can have, and it's gonna have a, a linear um, effect on on the metadata changes but uh, i know of running a few maybe you know tests that i've made where to run the dozen a dozen i think people tried it with more uh, i wouldn't use a thousand gateways um with with this feature um, set in in that case I would turn off uh, the um, the cache. Okay. Uh, another question from Lucas here. Uh, the latest Nginx version supports unbuffered uploads. Uh, is there any plan for that as a replacement for Apache? Well, um, the the problem that we've had with Nginx is that. Internally, the architecture it uses is asynchronous, and Aljabi itself is synchronous. Now, the question is whether are you, if you're using it, using uh, fast CGI, uh, then as long as Nginx does it correctly, uh, then it should work out of the box. We we we're not testing it, uh, but know that users are using it, so. Okay. So it's cons okay. in that case, if you're, you're willing to take the 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 amount of testing, um, then you can you can run it. 
Oh, I see. Here's a follow-up from BH. This makes a little bit more sense. So he's asking if, if too many RGW instances will cause, problem, cause problems. It uh, looks like they're thinking about um, running an RGW on every single one of their OSD nodes. Uh, probably just wants to know if this would be okay or if this is going to cause problems. Well, depending on how many OSD nodes uh, you have. Uh, I, I would assume that you you'd have issues um, with too many, as I said, with the watch notify, with the cache pro propagation uh, for the metadata. In that case, I would uh, turn off the, the metadata cache, which would affect performance. So, you know, it's... Um, it looks like they'll have about 500 OSD nodes. Um, if they just turn off some of the chattier portions of that, should that still be all right in terms of functionality? You'll lose the watch notify, but is that going to be better? You you lose the metadata cache. So object read every operation set is going to be slower, right? It's going to be multiple round trips for for the OSDs for for each um, operation. Um, but it, it'll scale better on the other hand. So you know. It's it's a trade-off. I'm not sure that having 500 gateways is the way to go. <laughs> uh, see another question from Derek here is uh, is anyone else asking for a way in the S3 interface to list the buckets you're not owner of but have access to? Um, he knows that that might break the S3 compatibility, but uh, heard anybody looking for that? I'm not aware of any problem with the S3 API not able. I I do you mean able to when you're listing the the the, the actual buckets, right? Um, not listing the objects within the the buckets. Um, yeah, with with S S3 it's not possible, and the the current way to do that is to use the metadata API that we provide, the admin metadata API, which allows you to list all buckets in the system, but it's it requires uh, users to have uh, special admin caps for that. Um, so yeah, I, I, I the context I've heard it, uh, this request is to make it uh, more Swift-like, because in Swift, you you have multiple users that all, that can share if they are on the same tenant they can share the same bucket um or containers or all, all refer to the same data in in for us we can achieve that by using uh, sub users which is a feature that i'm personally am not too fond of uh we if there is a compelling use case we might we might want to reevaluate how to do that and and what's the exact use case that users need um, we we are going to look at uh, the multi tenancy it might be something that can can be done in that context okay looks like tyler's asking if there are any plans to implement the ability to generate an md5 on an uploaded object and retrieve it later um well the 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 short answer there's no such plan the, the long an answer is that when you upload an object uh we assign an etag etag uh field to it that is usually the the md5 sum of that object but it's only correct for for simple uploads. For multi-part uploads, the the etag etag is actually um, an MD5 sum of the MD5 sums of of the parts that you uploaded. Yeah, it sounds uh, because... like he's he's storing backups so and wants to know if they're stable when they pull later. Tyler, are you storing these as a a large single object backup file or is this okay? So it would be a single a single large object then with a single MD5 then. 
um well as the e tag and yeah well the the, the problem with, with that is that um we don't have when, when we, we do um a multi-part upload we don't access all the data con uh, uh, serially and so we in order to actually uh, pr provide that information we once the object is has complete the upload we need to go over it again and reread it and mod modify it maybe the solution here is either use the 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 e tag that we provide because it basically is um, something that is unique to the data uh, uploaded, although it also depends on the way it was uploaded. Or uh, once the object has completed the upload, or or maybe 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 setting that information on the object when uploading it. Like if if the client knew uh, that that uh, um, information could could set it as an extended attribute on the object. Is this also something we could potentially use Rados classes for if somebody wanted to extend that? Well, could we could we have an MD5 checksum as a Rados class reaction to placing objects in the cluster? Object classes work on a single Rados object, um, whereas the um, that information. Uh, it, we we don't have we, we we cannot do it because the the, the Redis gateway objects are split into multiple Redis objects. So okay. in order to do that, it's basically like rereading everything. Gotcha. Okay. Um, one quick question. Looks like uh, asked someone uh, Vivek Cherian was asking if they could uh, replace. The OpenStack Swift object store us with Rados Gateway, which is actually something that we've long talked about. Um, so the answer is yes. Uh, but Yehuda, did you have anything you wanted to add about the current state of using Rados Gateway as a drop-in replacement for OpenStack Swift? Well, the thing with OpenStack Swift is that um, that the its API is very very fluid, <laughs> right? Um, OpenStack Swift is not an API. It is or I wouldn't say OpenStack Swift. Swift is is not an API. It's a product. Uh, it's a sim specific product implementation. We we strive to make our um, the the gateway as as compatible as we can with um, with Swift. And I know there has been tremendous work that's been done. Uh, by um, community co contribu contributors, by people from Mirantis um, and from other places in order to make it even more compatible. So I know of people who are using it instead of, of OpenStack Swift. And um, so I don't see why not. Now the question is whether there are specific f features in OpenStack Swift that are needed um, that, that we might not support and I'm not aware of any major feature. So the the only major difference, well, major, <laughs> major is debatable, but the only major difference between the two right now is um, the the kind of per user uh, namespacing stuff, right? Isn't that the biggest, the biggest hurdle between S3 and Swift? And because the, we were based on S3 first, we went one way right. and Swift went the other? Uh, well, the, it's it's more complicated than that. Uh, the, the, the short answer is yes. The the reason w why we went with this and not with the other is when Swift, uh, when we started, Swift was also really at the beginning, and its user model was wasn't something that was really completely thought out. I think at that point, so so we we went with to, we tried to make it as closer as what we understood uh, Switch was doing, but you know, apparently it was going different direction. Okay, um, so it looks like we had a question back here a ways from Abhishek asking, what are MD log, by log, and data logs context of RGW admin and RGW right. agent think? Yeah. So MD log is the metadata log. 
every metadata change that happens on uh, the master zone in the master region is needed to be logged there. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to to sync that information. Uh, the data log is the the list of all the buckets that changed. Uh, it's a log of all all the buckets that changed um, in a certain we. we Within a certain time range, so we we don't update it for all change that happens in the bucket in a, an object within a bucket. We only do it like uh, once every thirty seconds or fifteen seconds, so that not each try uh, requires updating the log. And the date uh, BI log is a backend index log is a log that we keep. Uh, within the bucket index, and that for every uh, object modification. Okay, uh, Abhishek, does that answer your question? He had a follow-up: sync agent and metadata agent sync. Uh, if not in data path, for example, in bucket creation, what does it sync? Only user data. But so sorry, I couldn't. Do it. Um, I couldn't understand the question. I don't know. It's a, a sentence uh, fragment. All right. So metadata sync. Um, yeah. If it, it'll sync, it's not gonna sync the the data itself, but it's gonna sync the user data and the bucket metadata. So the bucket metadata means the 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 actual actual bucket actors and the fact that the bucket belongs to a specific user and that stuff. You can um, maybe try to look at the um, metadata you can have the the, the Redis gateway, gateway admin metadata uh, command command set of commands for example Redis gateway admin metadata list and or metadata data list user metadata list bucket bucket dot instance so you, you can you can look at all the the metadata you can if you really want to cause damage, you can uh, to your data. You can modify that also. If you so. Okay. Uh, let's see. I think we hit all of the questions in the backlog here. Uh, anyone else have any questions before we wrap this up? What happens if a bucket is created in secondary region and master region is not available? Uh, then it wouldn't be able to create it. All right. All right, I think we hit all of the questions here in the backlog. Um, and I think it was a, a great tech talk. Thank you very much, Yehuda, for, for going through Rados Gateway with us. Uh, we'll all see right. all of you back here on the 23rd of April, hopefully, to hear... Uh, a chat about Calamari, both the uh, management API as well as some of the GUI options that are floating around out there. Um, but uh, until then, thank you very much for coming to the Ceph Tech Talk, and we'll see you on YouTube.